Hey guys, it's Shane here from Tank Hunter Miniatures, and in today's video, I wanted to break down which Space Marine tanks have the best functional designs. Uh, not just what they look like, but how well they would actually perform in a realistic situation. So first up, let's look at the Razorback and the Rhino. These are your classic armored personnel carrier, a good angled armor design for bullet deflection, good low center of gravity, uh, the tracks are protected, the only real weak spot is the top hatch. Now on the Rhino, that's designed to open up and allow quick troop deployment. But in the carrier, you already have the side doors, the back hatch. Is the top hatch really going to be important to, to go out of? Uh, the most realistic versions of this tank would be the Bradley fighting vehicles, uh, which if you look at the early designs are extremely similar. Uh, even the M2 had the same passenger space for six soldiers, same as the Razorback. Uh, the Rhino and the Razorback is very grounded in what a fighting vehicle should look and act like. So this is getting top marks for the design. The Predator, of course, uses the same body as the Rhino, but the turret is where you would see the issues come up. Uh, if you look at the designs, it would have been based off either the Challenger or the Abrams or similar battle tanks. Uh, you'll notice the tanks are far wider, flatter, have a larger counterbalance on the back. Uh, you can imagine the force it would create shooting from a side angle. It would almost push the vehicle clean over. Uh, in addition, the side sponsons are not something seen past like an MK5 tank. Uh, it's not seen in any kind of modern tank. Uh, now, if you have a Predator model, you know the first thing to break on them is the side guns. So in a realistic situation, that's what you'd expect as well. Uh, so while it's not a completely unbelievable tank design, it just has a lot of factors that wouldn't work realistically. Now the Vindicator is a very interesting design. The bulldozer blade isn't too hard to imagine mounted on a modern tank. The main example of this I could find was in the Leopard 2 model. But the gun itself with such a large bore for being such a short range just seems risky to use. It's counting so much on its front armor to protect it while it moves up to deliver its payload, which doesn't make a lot of sense when you compare it to the tank it's based off of, the Strum Tiger, which fired its rocket projectile with a range of over five kilometers. So aside from being a situation where you had to get close up to an enemy to fire, because there's either a force field that couldn't be passed through from long range, or some defense system that would shoot shells out of the sky, the Vindicator just wouldn't be viable in a battlefield situation where artillery could do a much better job. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was in relation to both versions of the Vindicators was the fact that it's one of the few tanks in Warhammer that are turretless. The gun is just built into the body. Uh, there are a few tanks that have this function like the SU-100 which is a tank destroyer and like the Demolisher Cannon has the ability to alter its trajectory. However, the Vindicator Laz, the laser destroyer, is much more like the Stridwagen 103, which main gun cannot move on its own and requires the tank to move to alter any kind of targeting. Uh, there are a few other tanks I want to talk about that have this issue, but we'll get to it later. So the Land Raider and the Spartan tanks are not a bad design at all. They look awesome. They take obvious inspiration from the Mark V tank from World War I. Uh, the World War I style of tank suited its purpose, which was to storm trenches, cover dangerous ground, was essentially to fight an enemy that was dug in and not moving. This is why you see in World War II style tanks, it's a whole different style to replace them. It's more based on speed, heavier firepower, attacking an enemy before it had the chance to get dug in. So as a whole, you might see the Land Raider style tank as redundant, a Land Raider's primary function is to transport for the most part, which for a ground vehicle, still, this makes the most amount of sense design-wise. When it comes to the Whirlwind, Hunter and Stalker tanks, these will be considered MLRS, Multiple Launch Rocket Systems. In the modern world, these are many different designs, but what you mostly see is a missile launching platform attached to a truck bed, more or less. So an armored tank design is not generally needed, when they're firing at a target from so far away. But it makes more sense for the Space Marines to adapt this from a vehicle they're used to using. It's not unlike the T-34 Colope, which was mounted onto an M4 Sherman for reasons. Uh, so the Space Marine artillery tank gets top marks as well. 
Now let's look at the Primaris tanks, which don't translate to the real world as they use an anti-grav propulsion system that hasn't been invented yet. But let's look at the other aspects and get an idea of how well these guys would work. So looking at the Gladiator, I'd say its main issue would be its tall. It's kind of blocky, so it gives a large profile as a target, and for a hovering tank, I'm not sure how well the aerodynamics fit into the situation. But you can see these guys would not be ideal in that sense. Uh, the weapon profile is pretty good though. Uh, the side guns are secured into the side well. They look like it would be hard to dislodge them. Uh, the turret's profile is more flat and wide than the Predator tank, so it's much more sensible a design. Uh, the main issue with the weapons is something many other tanks have, and that's a twin barrel design, which looks cool, but doesn't exist on any modern tank, and there's a good reason why. But let's go over the obvious one, being that it's twice the work uh, to deal more damage from a tank, when if that's what you wanted to do, just put a bigger gun on the tank, not just add another of the same. Uh, the Reaper design I can understand as it's more anti-inventory, so having a wider coverage of the shots you're firing makes sense. But on the other hand, if accuracy isn't important and you just want to spray as many bullets as you can, you have to ask yourself why aren't you using a larger profile explosion to do the same job for much less work? As for the Valiant, again, you have two shorter range guns instead of one bigger one that will do the same amount of damage. So we have to give the better marks here to the Lancer design, which still isn't perfect, but it's making the best effort. The Impulsor, I'm trying to work out if it would even classify as a tank or APC, as it's a transport that has no closed space for its transport, which is only six men, which is the same as a Razorback, but lacks any real firepower that the Razorback makes up for. So in game, it functions more like a land speed of storm. A rush in, drop the guys off, and then give it some cover fire. Uh, just not a great unit, not a great design. Now for the Repulsa. Uh, this gives off huge Bradley vibes again, even more so than the Razorback. This is the kid saying, you can copy my work, but change it a little so people don't notice. Uh, this guy is equipped with a weapon for everything. It's going to move in fast, move troops around, and still be laying down weapon fire against armored targets and infantry. It can look like it has too much going on and have more darker than an orc can handle, but it fits a very important part of being a tank that can handle being put in any situation. But when it comes to the execution of Variant, we start to see some of the issues of redundancy. So you have a dual barrel turret, which we've already explained why it doesn't work well, and then you put one that's good at doing long range anti-armor damage and put it in the same firing position with a gun that's designed to be anti-infantry. So in theory, both guns would fire at the same target, but what's even the point of that? Rules wise in the game, this isn't an issue as every gun has a free, 360 degree firing range, but realistically, it's such a bad idea to have both these guns doing very different jobs locked in the same position. So the executioner gets low points as it's just way too over the top. Lastly, let's take a look at a few heresy tank designs, uh, starting with a big guy, the Kratos Heavy Assault Tank. Uh, just shy of being a Lord of War choice, this guy is massive, which makes it hard to compare to a realistic tank design, but overall, it's pretty solid. Again, the side sponsons are an issue, but the turret is flat, wide, and while it does come off as blocky overall, uh, it isn't going to hinder it, as it's not going to deal with much wind-resistant issues, as it doesn't need to go fast. It should be able to outrange most other tanks with its massive guns. So, yeah, top marks for the Kratos. Now, this might be a controversial take, but I do not like Sicarians in any form. This has to be the worst designed tank I have seen to date. Now let me explain, you have a tank with all its weight in the back, its engines are high off the ground, with its turret supporting a massive guns in all versions of the tank, which would give massive recoil when firing without some special anti-recoil tech, but let's look at it from a realistic view, and when you have this narrow front, which is going to weigh so much less than the back end, how is this tank not going to topple over backwards every time it fires or goes up some mildly sloped hill? Uh, not to mention the main battle tank, as previously mentioned, pointless dual barrels. Uh, just have a bigger gun. Now let's look at the other versions. Uh, the Punisher. 
all the same issues, and now you have a massive gun hanging off the side with a very exposed weak point, you're able to dis disable the main cannon so much easier. So yeah, this gets an equally bad rating. Uh, the Omega Tank Destroyer. This guy has two Warhound Titan Plasma Cannons. Uh, the amount of power contained in this tank would make it a walking plasma nuke that could go off at any time if you left it charging for too long. Uh, this is a hazard to everything near it. Uh, the Arcus Strike Tank and MLRS Battery as the turret. Not terrible, but why though? It could just as easily put on a smaller tank profile and would deal just as much damage. Lastly, the Venator Tank Hunter, which fixes the balance issues with the main cannon weighing enough to keep the front on the ground, but then we're looking at two issues. One being the same as the Omega, where this guy is going to make a huge explosion as the whole tank is just one giant gun, and two, its turret is fixed into one position. Like we mentioned with the Stridswagen tank, uh, it's not going to be able to target fire unless it's stationary, and the Venator can't change the angle of its gun in any form. Its primary targets are going to be heavy armored tanks or fortifications that have to share the same level as the Venator, and being slow and unable to move at all. So again, bottom mark, so I'd have to say Sicarians are the worst designed tanks of all Space Marine tanks. Alright, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you'd like me to make another one of these tank rating videos for a different faction. Uh, until then, please subscribe if you haven't already. i really like to hit 1k subs before the end of the year, so it would mean a lot to me if you did. And thanks again for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.